dude how how were the holidays they were good i like how you guys are in short sleeves i am uh i'm jealous <laughs> um it's so 18 degrees here is it really yeah oh it's uh i've got a space heater on right now miss 44 um it's 2022 right happy new year yes <laughs> happy uh, new year and new year. i I think heaters, central heat has been out for how many decades now? Uh, yeah, but my bank account only holds so much money and the heat here is expensive. So, and plus I have three levels. The basement is always freaking cold. So the top level is a nice cozy, you know, 68 degrees down here. It's, it's like 37. Are you drinking by the way? Yeah. Are we recording? Yeah. Oh, I guess we are. <laughs> yeah, we are. Okay. Right, so as I open this up then. This is Estrella. I'm going to talk about Barcelona today, I think. Um, and this is a beer from Barcelona. Um, I, I picked this one specifically just because you can get it just about anywhere in the States and probably anywhere else in the world, to be honest with you. So Sweet. Estrella means star. The uh, people who make Estrella is called Dam, I think, or Dam, D-A-M-M. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I had a lot of this while I was over there. Um, so uh, malty, sweet, um, Nice little finish on it. Uh, it. It feels like a dark beer, but uh, it doesn't linger like a. Uh, it's not as heavy. It doesn't feel heavy on your stomach. You know, well, I always nice. thought, I always thought Australia was a country. Australia. Australia. That's what you're drinking, right? Australia. Australia. Star. Australia. Spanish for star. <laughs> <laughs> um, not a country. Not a sounds, country. Sounds like Australia. <laughs> um i am drinking title number 21 whiskey no i've never heard of it what's it from uh, it is question man um it looks like it might be from the states it is from the states okay yeah doesn't say specifically where i guess it probably does in the back oh it's texas texas dallas Nice. Huh. Dallas. Dallas whiskey. That's weird. Is Dallas is a uh I mean it tastes like whiskey. It's okay, you know. Uh, there's much there are many better whiskey out there. And uh I think that for its price point, I think it's right around Jack Daniels price point. I'd rather oh, stick with Jack. Okay. But uh, uh yeah, it's just my package store has been carrying a lot of different bourbons and whiskeys and rye lately. So I'm just kind of going through the list because they're always bringing in new ones. That's nice. Okay. Yeah. I, I've been practicing how to pickle my uh, my liver. <laughs> uh, so Matt, uh, how you been, man? Yeah, I've been good. Um, yeah. The whole family was sick for a while. Uh, nothing COVID related. It just, uh, just a really bad cold. It just kept passing from one person to the next. So then I kind of felt bad because we didn't tell the um, some other family that were pregnant when I came over. <laughs> They're kind of <laughs> upset about it. <laughs> like, you should oh, have fun with them. We're like, uh, we're not pregnant. What do you say about Joyce? Uh... Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he can take it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... yeah. So, but uh, Riley uh, uh, is getting a lot more verbal now. So that's fun. Oh, yeah. So she can say one, two, three, and eight, nine, ten. Oh wow, she's smart too. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> and one, um, two, three, eight, nine, ten. That's six more numbers than you can. Yeah. <laughs> and that rhymed nice. Yeah. Oh, hey. <laughs> yeah, and she's doing well at daycare. Starting to play with other kids. Yeah. So I'm pretty happy. It's good. What about you, Andy? Uh, yeah. No. So uh, same. Except for our sickness came from my son, who brought it to our house got us all sick and then right when we're just getting it so i'm still congested not, none of this is covid we all got tested um I, i'm still congested I'm, I'm i'm like at the end of it so probably a couple more days and i'll be clear of it uh and then my son comes home with something else and it's a stomach bug some type of like oh. nova virus or whatever it's called and then stephanie gets it so i'm just like y'all stay over there just <laughs> stay away from me <laughs> keep that bug between yourselves <laughs> they're both like like stephanie's throwing up i think she vomited oh. like six times a day oh oh so, yeah she's not doing so hot um and she's in her third trimester she's a trooper 
I don't know how she does it. Um, and then my son is, he's just trying to get through our entire box of diapers before we move in two weeks. Uh, might be the last time you see this bookshelf or next week, <laughs> next week's the next last time you're going to see this bookshelf. Um, I'm moving my, uh, I'm, I'm going to have a different office where I have a library in a different room. So you won't see as many books behind me. Nice. So what do you got in store for us today, Annie? And, and before you get into that, just want to let everybody else out there listening know it's a new year and you two motherfuckers have stopped running. Matt like trots along on his little walk path and I don't know what the fuck Andy's doing these days. I, I lost my watch after Spain and then um, I was <gasps> running, but I wasn't running much. It was like once or twice a week. And then uh, I haven't ran in like, I don't know, seven days. I haven't ran this year. I have not ran this year. <laughs> that sad. makes me sad. Sad. Oh, sad. I ran yeah, once so, this week. Um, I, I figured I'd uh, spend... Our first episode back, I was intending to talk about Barcelona, and this happens to be that episode. Um, I was in Barcelona almost a month ago now, so uh, apologies to everybody who's actually trying to uh, stick with our podcast and watch it as it comes out. Uh, I uh, that that's my fault. I got sick and I kept on pushing this out, so apologies. But yeah, this is the uh, famed episode that nobody heard about, where I'm going to talk about Barcelona and my trip over there. I was there for ten days. Uh, I had the good fortune to go right before, um, uh, what's what's this virus called? What's this new variation called? Omicron. Yeah. Omicron, Omicron. for CI six. Right before <laughs> it became like massive in the world. Before it was even named, we were there. We were in Barcelona when it was named, and uh, yeah, it we, we got lucky because we got back before it got nasty. But our flight over there, we went first class, American Airlines. It was incredible. Had one of those seats where you like take up the whole row and you have the wall, you lie down flat, you have your own TV, recliner, um, three meals for the flight over. Fantastic. Loved every second of it. Um, but yeah, uh, we went in December. December is a fun month for Barcelona. Uh, in December, they're like prepping for Christmas uh, and it's a huge religious area. So uh, as soon as we got there, you see the skyline just peppered with churches and cathedrals, and it's it's just incredible. Um, mountainsides, the whole nine yards, you, you just see everything. You, you see the beach on one side and the mountains on the other. Um, fantastic, fantastic view. It, it was never cold while we were there. We were afraid that December might be a cold time to go to Barcelona, but I think the coldest it got was like, I don't know, probably... 50 degrees 60 degrees barely jacket weather if you're from the dc area um if you're not from the dc area if you're from georgia like <laughs> the three of us are then you probably want to bring snow gear um but yeah uh as soon as we landed we went to our hotel we uh do Kessa suites right off the beach in uh, gothic quarter um fantastic little spot walkable to like all the touristy spots in gothic quarter um and uh yeah it, it was that was a fantastic spot i i it, i had no problems with the hotel they were good people um the hotel rooms were small but we didn't spend a lot of time in the room so it didn't really make too much of a difference for us um and we went when it was cold so the pools at the uh the rooftop were closed so we didn't get to try anything on the rooftop um let's see so I think the big things to talk about in Barcelona is going to start with like Sagrada Familia. So Sagrada Familia is this massive cathedral that's been, uh, that's been under construction for, oh man, I forgot. I, I just looked this up like two days ago in anticipation of this. It, it's been longer than our parents' lifetime. So um, easily longer than the last 70 or so years. And, and it won't be done before any of us die. Uh, they just put on the, what's her name? Mary. Oh. They put on her little statue at the top of um, the cathedral there. And then the, the tallest cathedral, there's a bunch of points and they all represent um, something from the Bible. And the, the tallest point is going to be uh, Jesus. And he's going to be the last one to put out there. And I don't think that's happening in our lifetime, but we took a tour of Sagrada Familia. Uh, incredible place. Um, 
and it, it's named after the uh, Sagrada family, Sagrada Familia. Uh, and they're the people that uh, started the fund for it. And I think it's mainly funded by like donations and tours now for it. Uh, and, and as I've mentioned before, we went there during this COVID mess. So it was mandated masks everywhere, but it didn't feel like most of the people cared about masks. So there were some places that were like, hey, mask up, but th those were rare, like super rare. Mm -hmm. Most restaurants, you walked in there without a mask, nobody cared. They, they checked your COVID passport. If you're an EU citizen, you have COVID passports, which is way cooler than what we get in the States, but it's this digital passport you carry around your phone with a QR code that shows like you're vaccinated and keeps up to date with everything. There's two states in the United States that does that. It's Virginia and New York, I think. Um, and I had mine, but it didn't work. Uh, but otherwise, if you're a U.S. citizen traveling over there, you have to bring your vaccination card. And that typically worked. It worked everywhere. We didn't, we didn't have it to a point where it didn't work. Just a few people didn't know what to do with it. Um, Hang on a second. Yeah. So you said a really important word there, restaurants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How's the food in Barcelona? It is very different. I enjoyed every single bit of it. I loved it. Um, it's uh, so I think the strangest thing I didn't expect was the whole fried fish. And the, it, like, there's a ton of tapas. We ate mainly tapas. Tapas are uh, for you, for, you, for those of you who don't know, I know you guys know, for those of you who don't know, they're like small plates and you, you, you get a few of them and you share it with everybody at the table. It's a very social kind of fat of um, a meal. Um, usually you don't eat a lot. It's, it's just more, it's more about talking and having company than it is about um, eating. So a lot of the restaurants there are just tapas. Um, outside of Barcelona, you'll go to tapas bars where you just order beer or some type of drink and you'll get free tapas. And most of the places in Barcelona they went to, except for one, um, you didn't get free tapas with your alcohol, which was a little strange. Um, but yeah, no, the food was awesome. What I was trying to talk about was the, one of the weird things we got was like this whole fried fish. I don't, I still don't know what kind of fish it is, but it was like, um, and I'm doing this with my hands. Uh, there was, a, it was roughly like six inches long. It was tiny. Um, and they, it was, it was fried from head to toe and you just, you ate the whole thing like bones and all. And it was delicious. Really? It was crispy. It tasted amazing. Um, I think they, they, they got to the bottom of it, but the rest of it, the rest of the skeleton was there. Uh, Do you remember what it was called? Fried fish. Pes, pesca, fried fish. Pescalitos. Pescalitos, I believe. Pescalitos. Um, Stephanie is going to listen to this and be like, you're an idiot, Andy. <laughs> um, <laughs> they, uh, did they speak a lot of English over there? Pesacitos. Pesacitos. Uh, yes. Yeah. Most people that I spoke uh, with spoke English. I, I needed Spanish to get around some places um, and to get book recommendations. Like when I went to the library, I had to use my Spanish in order to find the English book. Weirdest thing ever. But um, <laughs> I, I ended up getting my book. But yeah, it, it, was, it was a strange, strange encounter because we talked about an English book in Spanish. Um, but yeah, yeah that, I, go that fried fish is going to be the next like hit pop song, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Esacitos. Anyways. Yeah. Um, so, so what about the tapas, man? You know, we've gone out for tapas quite a good bit of time while we were in college. Right. So yeah. major difference, big difference. Um, I would say, I would say a significant difference and it was mainly cultural. Uh, I feel like when you do tapas in the US, US, there's this need to make it somehow foreign. So like you'll, you'll have your regulars in there. Usually someplace around here, they'll do some kind of like meatball or something like that. Um, that doesn't, that's not typically a Spanish tapa. But um, I, I think the biggest difference was stuff like uh, pan con tomate, which translates to bread with tomato. And, you know, it doesn't sound like much and it's not much. It's like, it's just bread they rub a piece of garlic on the toast and then they spread around like they, they squish a tomato, a fresh tomato, and they squish it on top of the bread and they season with salt and pepper. And you think it's nothing until you realize they baked the bread, they grew the potato and they grew the garlic. And then it's also you taste lazy it all ass together. Bruschetta, man. What was that? <laughs> it's also lazy ass bruschetta. It is lazy ass <laughs> bruschetta, but it's also the tastiest <laughs> I've ever had. It, it sounds was, good. I ordered it everywhere. It is the like the most simple dish. 
Um, and I fell in love with it so much that like the first week we were back, I made it here. We oh. just, we can't, we can't get the quality <laughs> here. Like Wait, I got so, the bread, but that was it. So is the food over there as romanticized as it is over here? Meaning, you know, when we think about eating in Spain with people growing their own food and making their own breads and all of that, is that, is that the rule or is it the exception? Uh, I found no places that bought that you store bought anything at the restaurant. Every restaurant made everything. Wow, um, that is so cool. Every single one of them had a bakery. Like either they had a bakery or they bought from the bakery that was literally next door to them. And that that was probably the the strangest part is to like order bread and not just get like this you know sunbeam <laughs> crap on your plate. Um, I I really like that part. And so. When you go for pastries and coffees, which we did a lot of mornings, and when I went there, I was like, I'm not going to like pastries for breakfast. I'm not a pastry guy. I want my omelet, ham and cheese inside, or give me an egg sandwich, something like that. Their croissants were out of this world. They were amazing. They were buttery. They were flaky. And every single one of them was made differently because everybody baked their own croissant. So um, yeah, I got to ask a question that I'm sure every listener is dying to know. How close is the food to Mexican food here in the United States? <laughs> How as close as it is to the Chinese food. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so, so I, I didn't have a single tortilla. I, not, well, so I think the tortilla is more yeah, tortilla means, from geez. the natives, right? When the Hispanics yeah. uh, colonized South America and Central America, I think a lot of that uh, maize and that, type of food that the hispanics eat now in latin america i think it's primarily influenced by the the aborigines right right uh, right so i didn't know if there were still some type of influence that you see in american hispanic food that you found in barcelona couldn't you even there. find a mexican food i tried I, I tried to find a mexican restaurant because i was <laughs> curious but um the closest they had they literally called tex-mex and oh, really? it was the tex-mex crap that you would expect here like it was Wait, Just you didn't go. Kind of pathetic. No, I didn't go. Okay. No, I looked at the menu. Like I, I looked, Should've I looked went, for man. these places, so I can go. There. So I did go to a sushi place. I was like, "Hey, they're closer," you know. That should okay. be better. Uh, was it good? No. Oh <laughs> no, it was it was the worst sushi I think oh, I've had. Wow. Um, not probably not the worst, but it was pretty bad. I don't want to name them just because like it was bad. Uh, the cook the the cook was um a white uh white person and like i don't even know if he visited japan <laughs> just like, pictures of it, it was it was just <laughs> it sure. was so bad like their california <laughs> roll um and i appreciated that they Wait, went with less rice and more like what's stuff it fucking called a california roll over there <laughs> i know i know like i but I, I like they had it so i was like okay i'm curious like is it the same thing it's exactly the same except for it tastes worse i don't know how they made it taste worse uh but the, the fish wasn't fresh um the rice wasn't seasoned properly it, it was they, they decided to dump an entire pound of sugar in there i guess i don't know um uh the uh the seaweed the kim was super chewy like it was it, all around just terrible i don't i was surprised that it was a five-star place for sushi in that area really oh yeah it was absolutely <laughs> bad it was packed when we got there it's it's kind of eye-opening because now i'm sitting here thinking to myself i don't know anything about spanish food like nothing yeah so i so i, I actually wanted to spend some time talking about that so in the, in the U.S. and for us, like we take food and, and in the Asian culture, food is like all about flavor. It's about plating. It's about enjoying it. And it's a little bit about the social behavior. In Spain, they, they flip the script. It's a lot more about the experience than it is about the flavor. So like the taste is there, like they do a good job with the taste, but it's a lot more about that person to person feel. Like when you have somebody providing service to you, it's not, hey, what do you want next? Or, um, hey, uh, are you ready to order? It's like, hey, how's your day going? You guys liking really? everything so far? How'd you guys find us? Awesome. Cool, cool. So, yeah, my name is blah, blah, blah. I came from here from blah, blah, blah. I'm happy to help you guys today while you're at the restaurant. And these guys don't own it. They're, like, legit just servers. And you're just talking to somebody as if they're, you know, a friendly stranger. 
and they have this conversation with you and then it's like oh yeah i need to order something um yeah can i can i get blah blah blah? and they're like sure whatever here you go and they'll they'll bring it out and if you just sit there after ordering that they'll never come back to you they'll never bring you your check because it's rude for them to bring you your check unless they're closing they'll just sit there until you call them over they won't bother you they won't do anything they also don't have a tip culture right they don't have oh yeah no tip culture in fact it's rude to tip Hmm. it's super rude to tip um and if you do tip, you're not supposed to tip over like 5% or something like that uh, because it, tipping makes it look as if you're holding yourself at a higher position than the person helping or providing you any service, which makes sense. You don't tip your attorney, right? Which, I mean, for any of my clients out there, if you want to tip me, that's fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, you, I mean, you, you, don't, you don't tip other professionals. So it, it's, I guess for them, it's the same way. Like they, they, they come in there, they uh, start their job as a server and they expect to someday like own a restaurant or manage a restaurant. So for them, it's, it's a career. And this is the, you know, second or third step, because I don't think you've come in as a server um, there. I think they, they treat the, the, the locals like that as well. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I was the one that everybody knew wasn't from that area. Um, so when I showed up the table is when they switched from Spanish to English. And it wasn't me saying anything. As soon as I showed up, they just switched. <laughs> I'm like, no, I get it. Um, but when, when it's just Stephanie, like they, they ignore the fact that I might be close to her and they just they talk to her straight in Spanish. And then when I step in with my crappy Spanish, uh, they either give me a small smile, like, oh, that's cute, you tried. Or um, they'll, they'll try to respect the fact that I'm trying and they'll speak okay. in Spanish. Or they just switch to English altogether to make it fast. Right. Okay. Um, but yeah, do you feel they, like the, uh, okay. go ahead. No, I do you feel like the people in general over there appreciate that you try to speak uh, their language? I think it was a mix. Maybe I want to say less than 50 50, but it was about 50 50, where people uh, appreciated that I tried. Um, I, in saying less people appreciated that I tried more people were just like, you're wasting my time, man. Like here, <laughs> I know English. We'll just talk English. Let's get this over with. I need you out of my store or I need you out of the line. It, the, the people who appreciated were people that didn't have that quota that they had to worry right. about the time issue. So if there was nobody else around, they appreciated, they took their time. They corrected my Spanish. Um, they were super friendly. Uh, and then, you know, if there was a big line, they just switched to English and, uh, finish whatever i was doing um but yeah yeah but on the food on spanish food i went we most most time was tapas um and tapas can range from everything so i'm not going to spend too much time talking about it but it's like you know your croquettes your uh your fish dishes your your cheeses your uh your jamon i don't want to say ham because is this distinct difference between ordering jamon and ordering ham in the U S and it's because like a leg of ham there that's actually been cured and whatnot can run you, you know, 10 to $15,000. And I'm talking about like a leg, a leg of ham. That's like maybe three foot long or something like that. It's stupidly expensive. Um, and it's delicious. Um, the other like popular tapas, like, uh, olives, fantastic olives. Um, what else, what else is huge? I'm leaving out some big ones, but it's nothing eye-opening, incredible. When you go to a tapas place, you're not going for the food. You're going for the experience of talking to people, enjoying uh, enjoying alcohol, having whatever wine or beer they have, and um, enjoy talking to people that you're with. Uh, and that's something else. Every place only has one to two th- kinds of beer. And uh, if you're on the same block, not each place will have the same kind of beer. So oh. a lot of times you can go in there and just ask for a cerveza and they'll just give you the only one that they have. So it's completely appropriate just to ask for one. Um, before we get into the beer, mm-hmm. before we get into the booze, Matt, here's what I hear, man. When we talk to Andy about food in Spain, you're eating fried fish with bones in it, a fucking ham leg and olives. <laughs> Jesus, oh. fuck, man. Did you eat anything good? <laughs> <laughs> All of those were good. They were yeah, absolutely good incredible. <laughs> um, we we went to one authentic place and uh, we got we got the uh, traditional paella, uh, and that the paella is huge there. You, you'll find a lot of places that quote unquote specialize in paella, 
like you'll find places here that specializes in pizza. Um, but uh, Barcelona is part of, um, oh man, I can't, I can't remember the name of the region. Uh, they're part of this larger region that's kind of got their own huge history with Spain, but they have their own paella and it's made with these like tiny noodles. Um, it's delicious. Uh, if you've had paella before, it, it's, it's got a similar flavor, more creamy though. Uh, they still do uh, the burnt bottom that like seems to be a shared uh, love between Hispanics and Asian people, like having that burnt bit at the end at the bottom of the pot. Uh, but yeah, it's super fishy. If, if you like fish, you can also order it with just vegetables. Uh, vegetables. Uh, I'm trying to think of another way to explain it because I'm not going too deep into the flavors, but the, the paella itself uh, is more about creamy. And if you, if you know the flavor of saffron, saffron is uh, very strong in it. Um, very good. Definitely try it. Uh, you, even if you have to go in the United States, try it. If you find a place that sells paella in the United States, it's probably pretty good. Um, so yeah. you added fishy saffron to uh, the, the It's menu. a fishy culture. I don't know what you want from me. You don't want to hear about the like the, the fried fish. The, or Japanese the, fish. Is, the Japanese is fishy, but they don't taste fishy. Uh, the, I'm kidding. I mean, like the, the fried fish sounds like a it's unique good. opportunity. It's incredible. Uh, I was just going to wrap that up and say, you know, your your ability to describe food that very few of us have experienced is kind of like Matt's ability to describe beer. <laughs> But, uh, you know, now at least you can get yeah, into what you're else. good at, the booze, right? Well, I mean, I, I mean, you're not going to be too impressed there. <laughs> like the, the, the food portion to me was was hard because I'm trying to encompass like 10 days worth of food. And we didn't eat three times a day. We ate five times a day oh. because you don't you don't have big meals at any point in Barcelona. And, and that, that's that's why that's what I was kind of what I'm trying to get across is like the flavors there. It's good. But I, while I wanted to go to Barcelona for the food, it was more the food ended up being a culture shock. Like I expected like these um, Michelin star everything everywhere. Like everybody had this amazing quality food that will just you die for to have. But it wasn't just that. It was the experience. It was like almost going to a unique fine dining place in the united states but everywhere you went was just this unique experience and they all had a theme inside the restaurant and they they executed it so well they treated it a lot more like it was entertainment than they did um like it was sustenance and it, it's it's incredibly different from the way i felt about food in the united states and i didn't walk away going oh the food is to die for but I will take a restaurant in Barcelona and have worse food than any restaurant I've been to in the U S if I'm with friends, a hundred percent, every single time. I really enjoy the atmosphere. I enjoy the fact that you're just taking your time. Um, and there, there's not a ton of options, but you're not there for the options. You're there just for the ambience. You're there to talk. You're there to just hang out and they, everything's surrounded by that idea that you might you you entered a restaurant when they open and they expect you to be there until they close how they survive monetarily i have no idea no idea steph and i were at a place for three to four hours we literally closed them and they didn't even care like we were like one of the last people to leave they didn't tell us to leave we just asked for the check and they're like okay hope you guys come back tomorrow have a good one <laughs> it, it was Aww. fantastic it, you know, it's it's um, sorry. I know you were going to get into the beer. It's kind of interesting because uh, now that that I'm looking into it, uh, you know, paella is also really popular in Mexican food and Mexican families. But so is pescaditos. Mm -hmm. uh, I just looked that up, and um, you know, you weren't lying when they weren't about presentation. <laughs> <laughs> they, they do not care about presentation at all. Like they, they slop it down and like, here you go. Nice. All right. So let's, uh, let's hear about the single beers that you get at the different yeah. spots. Yeah. So like in, in the U S you order a beer and they're like, Hey, do you want a 16 or a 24? And we all know what that means. So in Spain, you order a beer and it's, if you want a four or an eight and it's so different like, and I'm talking ounces, I, I, again, they don't use ounces, they use milliliters, but like they, they, um, 
they have three different sizes. I want to say it's like kava. No, kava is a drink. I forget. There's three different sizes. The small size is literally like three to four shots. Um, and the medium size to me is like three quarters of an actual beer that you get here. And then there are large ones, which turned heads every time I ordered it. And I was like, I don't, why have it if it's weird to order it? Right. But the, the large size, which to me was like just a regular, you know, mug. It's like, you know, you get yourself right. a 12 or a 14 or something. And but it was like a regular <laughs> mug of beer. But it, it was weird to order something that large. And I think it's because, you know, you're just supposed to keep ordering it. It was cheap. Like the beers were like $1.52 bucks at a restaurant, oh, wow. which is unheard of really around here for a decent beer. And then... Um, yeah, like I was saying before, you go to a place and they usually have one to two beers and Estrella and um, uh, another one where uh, the, the big ones is escaping me the name of it. But um, I, I think the other part was uh, with beer, they also have something called Cero Cero, which is zero zero and it refer references to a special kind of beer there that has zero percent alcohol. In the U.S., we think we have something similar where we have like, you know, alcohol-free beer, but they make it very differently. In the United States, you have beer that never had alcohol in it, and you're, you're buying a beer that just supposed to taste like a beer. In Spain, when you order a Cero Cero, it was a beer. They boiled the, beer, the alcohol out of it, and then they sell the flavor of that beer still in there. So there's like 0.01, 0.03% beer inside oh, yeah. of it still but it, or 0.03 percent alcohol inside of it still but it's still tastes like an actual beer you know u.s beers are like that too they actually have alcohol yeah. in it they yeah like odul's and you know uh the other non-alcoholic beers they're See, i thought odul's a made beer without alcohol though and it's, it's got it's got like 0.01 or something oh like i see yeah. yeah so i've had odul's and i never liked odul's um, Estrella has a Cero Cero or Sin, um, Sin Alcohol, uh, and uh, it's actually tasty. So um, I, I was trying to find it here. I want to see if we can get it imported because it, it was really good. It was the first 0% beer I've ever had that was actually good, and it was like 30 calories. Um, so it's 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 a nice it's a nice little beer. If you can find it somewhere, I don't know if you if you can find it easily in the states, but if you can find it someplace that can get it here, I recommend at least trying it. I think it's worth a six pack. Um, so awesome. yeah, oh that that was the beer. The beer is not really a highlight. It was more the wine. Like a lot of places had their own kinds of wines, and you just saw the huge like wooden barrels. It wasn't bottles. It was wooden barrels that they store there, and they bought it by the barrel. They hung it on the wall. And they poured it from the barrel. Um, and uh, a lot of places were like that. Some places had the actual bottles. And it, it, the wine was different everywhere you go. The best part about the wine is all of it came from Spain. And Spanish wine is absolutely incredible. Like there's this earthiness to it. There's an elegance to the sweetness. It's so freaking good. And I regret ever going to a restaurant in barcelona and not ordering wine it was so good i came but we came back with six bottles of wine oh. um you're only allowed to come back with four uh but oh man it was it, like the wine the wine is why you go to barcelona if you're, if you're going to consume anything in your body the wine they always order the wine everywhere you go each place has either their own wine that they make or they're buying from some local vineyard i think them I think the most popular Spanish wine in the United States is uh, uh, Tempranillo, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, probably the most popular is probably the uh, Rino, Rioja region yeah, and the, the uh, Grenache. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, I'm a huge fan of Tempranillo. Tempranillo, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is the grape. So you can have a Tempranillo from the Rioja region. And it's it, that to me is like, heaven but i've never had a tempranillo that i disliked so um if you've never had a spanish wine that's a good way to go if you're familiar with wines i would definitely recommend a grenache uh grenade grenache yeah grenache it is grenache okay um but yeah uh, it Garnacha. was the the, the Garnacha? Garnacha, whatever Garnacha. i don't know i'm sorry for anybody who actually knows <laughs> and, and i'm saying butchering it um but yeah no, like wines just 
oh my god like food is to the u.s as wine is to barcelona 100 percent. it was incredible and uh, i just wish i did it um outside of the food and beer i think the coolest thing about barcelona is its culture its art um there was an emphasis on sports that completely flew over my head uh so I, if you're into sports, if you're into football, then uh, you're probably be into their sports scene, but I'm not, so I didn't test it. Uh, but they're culturally, they love art. It's everywhere. Their, their streets are made for it. Um, uh, and like, it, it's so we went to a Picasso museum, had a lot of fun there. They did exhibits. I didn't realize I learned more about Picasso than I ever thought I would want to know um but it was a mix between gallery and a bit about his life and uh how he's connected to barcelona and why he's connected to barcelona uh it, i it's worth going to he's really interesting to think about and him and his love life was a whole another thing that was just crazy him and his sister too anyhow Lots of fun. Definitely recommend um, looking into it. If you're in the area, if you're not into the area, just look up Picasso's life because he's incredible. Um, something unique to Barcelona or unique to Spain is uh, flamenco. And flamenco is, I before I went to Spain or before I went to Barcelona, I thought flamenco was just dancing. Flamenco is like, uh, it's a whole entourage. So you have, you have somebody singing, you have somebody um, uh, you have two people playing instruments and then you have a like you know three to four dancers who are like, interchanging band. dancing huh yeah, very i mean more sophisticated but yeah yeah <laughs> like these guys they, they do they do they mix in the tap dancing in there too it's like a it's a whole thing it is very percussion heavy like the the drums are the people's feet feet um and uh it's 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 really fun to watch you get to see a story uh and if you know spanish you'll be able to listen to a story and watch them dance to it um and you get to see the uh, uh you get to see the dancers kind of tell a story as they they transition their their people out and in it, it's a lot of fun um definitely an incredible experience uh that to me was more like in terms of like getting food or drinks there, I, I, it was stupidly expensive to get drinks there. Like where you would have got one or $2 for a beer at a restaurant, they were charging like eight to $9. So, and, and you couldn't bring extra, you couldn't bring outside drinks in. So I guess it's, you know, kind of like our movie theaters, which I hate to say it like that, but they, they upcharge like crazy for that stuff. But flamenco is huge. So, you know, that's kind of a night thing you do. It's, it's an entertainment. There's not much talking though. So probably not date worthy um let's see uh, outside of flamenco um uh you have architecture architecture is massive like in the states we kind of talk about architecture right we we have um we have like those indian mounds in georgia we have uh, the smallest church in the world we have um the Smithsonian's, we have the National Mall, we have uh how'd uh, you go from a dirt mound to the Smithsonian? I'm just I'm trying to <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm trying to get stuff from like the rural area and uh the yeah. major major cities. I, I wanted to get to Golden Gate Bridge eventually so I can hit the West Coast. But anyway, uh we have we have like works of art that are architecture, but in comparison to Barcelona it's not just art, like we build just functional things. These guys build buildings that are legitimate art pieces. They're, they're sculptures and people lived in it. Um, it's, it's fantastic. And there's, there's a ton of people to look at. You can, you can view areas by a particular architecture or, or um, architect or you can just you know roam around and you'll find these like weird buildings in the middle of nowhere and there's a tour that just goes through it and people might still be living there and it's just fascinating it's 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 amazing to to watch it um to go in there and just see how they made art into function um but that that was definitely something i didn't expect uh, i expected to see 
you know, sculptures and art, but I didn't expect it to be functional. It's, it's just, it's fun to see art that's functional. Um, so yeah, go ahead. I, I, I want you to kind of like give us a little bit of insight into this. You know, us as Americans, we're a young country. <clears throat> Even if you look at antebellum architecture, it's not that old, right? Um, how difficult is it to distinguish the old world in Spain versus the new world when it comes to architecture, art, and culture? I mean, do you feel like you're walking around a country that's been around for a dreadfully long amount of time? Or, you know, well, dreadfully, it's, it, it, it's got to be a beautiful thing, right? To be able to see buildings that have been there longer than our country's been established. How's, how's that? When you're talking about architecture, are you talking about new architecture? Are you talking about old architecture? Yeah. It's both. It's actually both. Like um, my favorite ones were built like in the late 1800s. So not too old relatively to the United States, but um, still fascinating nonetheless. But what you were saying before about um, the intersection between old and new. Oh yeah. You can definitely tell like when you're in the heart of the city, when you're in downtown or uh, the very populated areas, it's like going into any other big city. It's exactly the same. You have the big tall buildings, you have the floor to ceiling windows, you have the homeless people on the streets, you have the street vendors, you have the two or three mentally ill people yelling at you as you're crossing, <laughs> like you have the whole nine yards. But as you, as soon as you get off that main artery and like, I mean, literally off the main artery to go into any of the other branches, the streets become as narrow as one uh, van. And it's a, it's, it's all one way streets because these streets weren't made for vehicles. These streets were made for walking and made for horses and carries or carriages. So nobody thought about vehicles back then. So these, these buildings are like on top of each other. They're super close. The roads, a lot of the times don't have asphalt. They're like cobblestone. Um, and there's more room for people. It's more intended for people to walk than it is for people to drive there. So when, people, when cars come, you see people just like go on the walls and it's literally single file. And sometimes you have to put your back on the wall. If it's a larger vehicle. Mm. Um, and, and yeah, like where, where the old meets new, that's crazy. Like as you're walking down this really narrow path and you see this car coming at you, just came off the main artery, you're like, oh man, this dude's going the wrong way. He almost ran me over. What an idiot. And then right. you're the <laughs> idiot there because you took forever to get off the side. So um, yeah, it, it's it's crazy. The, the older buildings are kind of hard to tell. They do a lot of um, remodeling. So nothing looked incredibly old. Nothing looked like it was deteriorating. Everything looked like they cleaned it recently um, uh, for, the, for the most part. What was weird was most of it is concrete and asphalt. I know we complain a lot about big cities in the US about how much asphalt there is everywhere. Completely different level. Like literally I saw no grass, no trees for a good half yeah. mile sometimes, just nothing. Um, and then when people were walking their dogs, it would, there was literally just pee and poop <laughs> everywhere. And oh. you kind of, you kind of had a, like, it was a minefield and public urination isn't frowned upon there. Like they have outside public urinals, but no walls, <laughs> for example. And you just go, you just go to the urinal you unzip and you go and people were like walking behind you and like, Hey Jim, um, I and mean, it's different. Uh, I don't think I like that part because I have a sensitive nose. So, you know, smelling somebody's uh, piss wasn't exactly fun to me. <laughs> but uh, still interesting. Um, yeah, we're, we're that, that's the, the old meets new is, was interesting. The, the electrical grid in some areas you could tell was different, uh, like how you saw the electricity come in. So in the US, when you look at your light, you have this steady stream of light, right? You don't see any flickering on my face. You don't see um, dimming. And like when, when it gets to 6 p.m. or any kind of rush hour or, or high voltage hour, you don't see like lights straining. You did there. Like when it was 10 a.m., which was the wake up time there, when it's 10 a.m. there, 
like you start to see the electricity kind of strain, you start to see um, little flickers in the electricity, it's not as reliable. So that one took me by surprise. I didn't expect that in, um, in Spain. Um, and That's what I happens when you stay skid row. <laughs> um, but <laughs> yeah, no, that, that was, that's, the electricity was interesting. I, this just reminded me to talk about the, the times there. So we woke up like five or 6 a.m. United States. So we figured we'll wake up around that time in Barcelona after we transitioned the time zones. And uh, yeah, nobody's awake until like 10 a.m. Businesses don't even open until 10 a.m. So it's literally you and some work people like roaming the streets. <laughs> everything's empty. Everything's quiet. And we basically had free roam the entire city for four hours. So breakfast is usually around 10 a.m. And their breakfast, there's no such thing as breakfast per se, really. It's just early lunch. Um, and then lunchtime is like 2 p.m. right before the siesta or during the siesta. And that was like two hours where businesses were closed. You can't do anything inside the businesses. It was just, you know, everybody's on their little vacation time. Um, and then the other, uh, you had a, uh, I'm going to do this a million times because it's easier for us to understand. You had like a pre-dinner snack at like 6 p.m. And then dinner was at 10 to 11 p.m which took us by surprise. Like getting reservations at good restaurants was near impossible because like they went so late for dinner and it was weird to us to eat that late. And then we were at a hotel and there was partying, of course, in the streets and whatnot. And they would nightly go until 3 a.m. And that was normal, 3 or 4 a.m. And, and I'm not talking about just partiers. I'm talking about just families with their kids and everything. And they're just out strolling around 3 a.m., which makes sense because you know they wake up at 10 p at 10 a.m so that one was that was a fun culture shock for us too just to realize that we could have actually stayed on u.s time the entire time we were over there and we would have been natives <laughs> <laughs> so yeah if you, if you go there from the east coast don't worry about the jet lag just go to sleep and wake up like you normally do and you're you'll be like a local <laughs> um did you guys go to any museums over there yeah we went to a lot of museums we went to the picasso museum um, we went to a lot of art galleries. Uh, we went to, um, a museum on, uh, Barcelona history, which is super interesting. They have this weird fascination with poop and it, it, they have this quote that says, um, eat well, shit often and never fear death. It's in Spanish, of course, but it's a fantastic <laughs> quote. I'm going to put it in our bathroom at some point and it's probably out there. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, like during their, their Christmas festivals that we went to, there was a, almost every other stall was this, where, where these figurines that people were selling of different people pooping, literally poop. Like there was a pile of poop, but they were squatting pants down, pooping. And it was wow. like famous people. Like the, the, the Trump was, up there too. <laughs> and it, it was, it was a sign of good fortune. And it's just so weird to see people pooping as a sign of good fortune. <laughs> Um, and I, I looked, I tried so hard to find the, uh, the etiology or the, um, where it came from. Um, but I, I couldn't find anything hard besides like some artists a long time ago, put it in there and, um, Barcelona and the entire region yeah. took it in as like, you know, their own, it was kind of their protest to the rest of the world because mm -hmm. that region and Spain do not get along. They, they, they have a more tenuous relationship than the south does with the u.s nice so are you referring to the catalans yeah thank you catalonian people thank you yeah they they are um they're a unique set of people i'm not sure that they would appreciate being called spanish uh but yeah so were there any signs of the old monarchy there um only in terms of rebellious people, like uh, protests and stuff like that, saying like, you know, the monarchy never changed, things like that. The, these guys were more, um, I, they, 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 a lot of them were more, they wanted more of a uh, communistic or um, Stalinist kind of government than they wanted anything else. So the, 
the old monarchy is kind of what they hang hung on to to show that Spain never cared about them. So you still see a lot of people like that. If you go to most of the local bookstores, which we went to like five or six while we were there, but when you go to those local bookstores, you'll see rows and rows of just literature on communism and socialism, which you'll find in the U.S., yes, but it's usually you're talking about, you know, two, two or three, like, rows of stuff, and then that's it. I'm talking about an entire wall of philosophy or political philosophy and Barcelona's ties to Stalinism, communism, socialism, like the whole it's it's intricate it's incredible I, I was surprised to see it and the other weird thing is uh so um uh catalonians and people in barcelona the the primary language isn't spanish it's catalan um which is similar but it's it's different enough that if you speak spanish you don't understand catalan so most people speak three languages there and it's catalan spanish and english um, if they if they speak Catalan, more than likely they speak Spanish, um, and then most people speak English. Now, so you picked up some wine, right? You brought some wine home. Mm. You, I'm guessing y'all grabbed some books too. Oh yeah. What about watches? So no, like I couldn't. I, I wouldn't buy. I don't think I'd buy a Spanish watch first off like if, if it's not made in switzerland i usually don't buy the watch um but their watches were not anything that i and nothing i saw was incredible i bought uh handmade shoes though oh oh yeah really? handmade in yeah. italy they but, do um, have, oh, in italy <laughs> 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 because i i found all the like handmade spanish stuff and i was like oh this is cool and i was like this is kind of quirky stephanie bought handmade spanish shoes and they they're they're awesome um but they're just, they all don't fit my style. It's just a bit more um, <laughs> playful than, I, and than I'm used to. So I, I've got them over there, but they're like, you know, street wear. They are the most comfortable pair of shoes I've ever had in my life. Also the most expensive set of shoes I've ever had in my life. But um, I really like them. They're completely leather. Uh, they feel good on my feet and I can actually, what what's, fun about the shoes that you find there is that you don't get the crap that we get sold here and i didn't realize it was crap until i was over there those shoes were actually made for walking and less about style so when you put them on and you expect to walk and feel the same no it's like it hugs your feet and it actually supports your arch and when you step down it feels like it removes the pressure from the ground and absorbs some of the pressure so that when you're walking it doesn't act you don't feel pressure in parts of your foot you don't feel the ground and I was just incredibly surprised. It, the only shoes that I had that came close to that are my ultras or my, any of my good running shoes, really, are the only shoes that ever came close to that. And so now I have you, dress shoes like this. Uh, okay, so they are dress shoes. Yeah, well, yeah, they're, well they're like smart casual. I wouldn't yeah, wear them to like work, but. My, uh, my most expensive dress shoes are made by Spanish cobblers. Mm. You're, but your nice dress shoes, right? Yeah, you know, yeah, but, I, I wanted but, to do that. I wanted to get nice dress shoes, but I, I didn't yeah. want to uh, haul them back. Yeah, yeah, they um, uh, they're definitely more American styled because they're double monks. Um, but you know, amazing shoes, man. I can walk in them all day, and yep. they're just they're just fantastic shoes. Um, yeah. So, what else did you guys do over there? Uh, let's see. Um, we uh, we took several tours. Uh, I highly recommend doing a hop on hop off tour mainly because, you know, it's in 15 different languages. So anybody who goes there is going to find, be able to like put on their earbuds and actually listen to the tour in their own language. And it's way cheaper than the public transportation and taxis there. And you go around the entire city. So much cheaper, just do it every day. Is, every day you use it is just going to be cheaper. Um, uh, funny story. And you guys know this, so I'm going to repeat myself, but while we were on the hop on hop off tour we were going it was like 6 or 7 p.m we were going through downtown um we were taking the hop on hop off tour just around the city as it went back to our hotel because cross paths for our hotel um and there is these street lights that hang um through the main streets and oh, one yeah. of them got <laughs> caught on the bus <laughs> at a red light and i'm looking at it i'm like the driver knows, right? So, so imagine <laughs> double-decker bus and like 
the <laughs> side view mirrors that extend out a bit. So it was stuck on the side view mirror. And it was like wedged in here <laughs> and it was like in it. Right. So it was like pulling and I, and I see the line and the light is like blinding right there. I'm like, the driver knows. Right. And this red light is taking forever. And I'm like, nah, he knows. He knows. <laughs> Stephanie, Stephanie starts nudging me. He goes, she was like, you need to go tell the driver. I'm like, he knows it's a bright light. It's there. They have to know. And then and then I see the car starting to stop and I see the bus like inch forward. Like, you know, he's about ready. Like, you know how you inch forward at a red light? And I'm like, oh crap. So we're the only people because it's 55 degrees. It's freezing for some reason, I guess, for everybody else. So we're the only people on this top deck that doesn't have a roof. So I'm like sprinting down the bus to get to the middle. I jump down the stairs and everybody's looking at me like I'm this crazy dude. And I'm like, light um <laughs> crap what's the spanish word for light there's a light it's stuck on the side of the view mirror and they were like oh, okay okay thanks act like nothing was happening like oh no big deal it's just another you know tourist doesn't know what they're talking about so they put it in park they come up there they look at the light and they're like we need to get everybody off the bus <laughs> <laughs> so as we're getting everybody off the bus this tiny lady she has to be like you know three foot ten inches she comes up and she's trying to like reach over the window to like grab the light and you can tell she's trying her best as she's on the tiptoe she's like leaning over the thing i'm like she's going to fall over so i'm like let me get it let me get it so she goes down <laughs> i'm like oh crap i've got to touch exposed wire literally sparking at this point i've got to touch it and move it so i'm like fishing for my leather gloves out of my pocket trying to put them on quickly like I, I fold my um I fold my jacket up and like tighten the tighten my glove over my jacket and I'm over here and I pull the thing out and then I uh, I like I bring it over into the side of the bus and the driver comes up and they're like oh thanks just put it over the side if I throw <laughs> this thing over the side these cars passing on the side it was going to hit the car so I look over then I look to him I'm like no. <laughs> and he just stares at me for like 30 seconds so i'm like okay i'm just gonna put this on the seat here <laughs> and at this point the cops come up the stairs and they're like you guys can leave we're like thank you <laughs> so Steph and i just like go down and then that night i'm like looking through the news because i was curious to see like how they fixed it and i see a picture of myself in the <laughs> news like with me like coming over and they have a video of me like pulling out the little light talking to this guy you can't see the guy so i'm like talking to like nothing in front of me <laughs> and then i put the light on the seat and i leave and i'm like great my first 10 days in a foreign country and uh, <laughs> i think you made the news <laughs> that's <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. man like i said to you before if that's what they got on the news it's a pretty good place to be then right oh yeah, yeah. i mean minus the fact that there was like um protests going on there was like two or three different but they have a huge they, uh they're protesting the mass constantly there and the vaccine requirements it's not much different than it is here to be honest with you except for it's probably less violent than mm -hmm. canada or the u.s but yeah you know, one of the things that you, you didn't mention, uh, where did you guys stay and what was it like? Duquesa Suites, um, hotel on the beach. Uh, we had a lot of choices um, in the Gothic Quarter. We're like, we, we, picked, we picked the Gothic Quarter just because it was central to everything. Um, but the hotel was really nice. Uh, it's, I'm trying to explain it. So uh, it, it's a beautiful hotel. So you go in there, you see the receptionist, and then, you know, smallish in front of you is the restaurant. And in between the reception and the restaurant are like three elevators. And then you hop on the elevator and things get a little weird. So you notice the elevator has a front door and a back door. No big deal. We've all been in those, you know, opens up one side or the other. Except for the floors aren't like level one isn't level one. So level one is like this. So it's staggered. So if you're on level one on the right hand side, so one A, you come out here, but one B is only like five foot higher and you go out the back. So it's like staggered like this, which is an interesting concept. I'm not sure 
what the idea was behind it, but it took us forever to figure out what was going on. And then we went on the roof and we realized like it's flat up there. So I have no idea. Like maybe one roof is just five foot taller on one side. I, I've, <laughs> it was, it was bizarre to me, like just seeing the elevator like that and um, realizing that uh, floor one isn't the ground floor was also a fun find. Mm-hmm. Floor one is the second floor. Um, and then third same floor, we were at with the fourth floor, huh? It's the same as Singapore too. Yeah, that's it. Was it was weird to me because they were like, "Oh, you're on the third floor." I'm like, "Oh, cool. <laughs> oh, three floors up. That's awesome. You know, we're not at the top, but that's fine." No, no, no. That was the top. It was the yeah. fourth floor. <laughs> it was just weird. Yeah. I don't know. Um, the restaurant was crap at the hotel. We went there once just because it was convenient, and um, we were leaving that morning, so we just we went there and make it easy, but. Uh, I don't. I don't know why you go to a foreign country and tr- go to the hotel's restaurant anyway. So it was just out of convenience. Um, really nice people though. Uh, they they spoke tons of languages, not just the three primary ones that I mentioned before. Uh, and every time we told them where we're going, what we were doing, they told us the fastest, cheapest way to do it. Um, oh, pickpockets! Pickpockets are huge there. And everybody who knows your tourist will tell you to watch out for pickpockets. They're all very friendly, and they all will tell you that the pickpockets are not native to uh, Barcelona. They just go there to steal people's money and stuff. So, um, yeah, uh, the La Rambla, which is like uh, the main tourist attraction, probably similar to how we view Broadway in um, New York, but uh, the main tourist attraction there. Uh, yeah, that's where most of the pickpockets are. It's massive. That's where that big market that you always see, um, the La Bocoria, that's where that is as well. That's where um, the pickpockets are. And they'll, they'll tell you, you know, do you have a backpack, wear it on your front. Um, no open pockets. Keep your wallet inside pockets, not not on a, if you have a jacket on, not on a jacket pocket, put it in an inside pocket. But you don't have a jacket on, wear a, like an indoor something or in like a fanny pack on your body or something whatever it's called um but yeah the pickpockets are pretty serious we, we never we didn't have an incident or anything like that and i always kept my wallet inside so i actually i didn't carry my wallet paying for things uh is simpler in europe in general because you don't use your card like we just caught up and start doing the chip here so you get to use the chip everywhere but there you just use your phone you uh, use a little wireless thing. It's probably the same thing in Singapore, right? Like yeah. you, you just, it's just the little signal. So it's way better. You don't, the, when you use your phone, you don't, you give them a credit card number, you get a virtual credit card number. So every single time you tap it, it's literally the only time that virtual number is used. So if it's fraudulent, the credit card company, you just shut it off. Um, it's fantastic. So I, I hope we switch to that model sooner rather than later. A lot of the stores here do it, but I wish it was more in the norm so I can get rid of my credit cards because I hate carrying credit cards now. I started, be, I started using my Garmin watch to pay for things too. <laughs> oh, you can use your Garmin watch for it? Yeah, at least mine. I can. He's got a fancy one, remember? Yeah. <laughs> you spend all that money or not running like every hour? <laughs> yeah. I, I know, I, every time I look at it. I, <laughs> I actually seek out vendors now that just use NFC. You know, oh. gas stations, grocery stores, wherever I go, they have mm-hmm. NFC. I'll I'll give them preference. Is oh, that really? what that is that what that thing is called? That little wireless transaction thing? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I didn't know that. You know, well, I mean, it's either Google Pay or Apple Pay, right? Here or, or Samsung Pay. Yeah. Uh, you or Samsung Pay. Yes. Yeah, still I use, use I use Google Pay. It's easier. Yeah, I do too. You know, I love it. Um, and yeah, I wish everything kind of moved to that direction, but we're not completely there yet. Yep. All right, boys. Um, y'all got any New Year's resolution? To uh, not catch COVID? <laughs> I've, I've been lucky so far. Me too. Me too. Yeah, no, yeah. no I, think, I think that's it. I, I, don't, I don't try to make New Year's resolutions. I, I don't set myself up for failure like that. <laughs> what about I'm you? Sorry, yeah. For me, I would just like trying to read one book a week. I'm working on it. <laughs> one a week. Yeah. What are you doing now? What's that? Are you slowing down or speeding up? Is my question. I wasn't reading that much before. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So I'm trying to get away from computer technology and, and read it. Oh. 
Yeah, wow, but I'm reading away like, from it. You're brave. Yeah. But I'm reading more of like um, stuff related to my career. So, or potential career, if I can get, get a job, actually. Well, that's fair. You're teaching, right? Uh, I don't have a job right now, unemployed. No, I mean the, so. the job you're looking for. Teaching. Yeah, yeah. English, teaching English. Okay. Yeah. Harder than I thought it would be. Yeah, I'm actually interested in what that looks like. We should we should do an episode or at least part of an episode on what that looks like out there and how yeah. job hunting there is different from here. Yeah, I wouldn't mind. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I did have a... Go, go ahead, Matt. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, I had an interview lined up, but the the HR person uh, um, flaked out on me twice. I was like, okay, I guess it's not working out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, that, that's interesting. Why don't, why don't we do that next week? Um, because, you know, you see all these people talking about English teachers in these Asian countries on YouTube, and it almost makes it seem like such an easy life. And, uh, you know, it's just, right it's just now, kind of true, actually, to be honest. Uh, well, I mean, to be fair, if you Other didn't have choice right here. now, it wouldn't be that easy for you, right? Yeah. Uh, you, you'd be back over here with us. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, it, it, it'd be really cool to know that kind of process and, you know, how you go about um, really establishing that choice of life. And hey, we might know. be able to segue into the uh, great resignation. That would be a fun topic, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> anti work is now like a yeah. popular yeah. subreddit. Yeah. yeah. Anti work um, or forced retirement, one of the two. Yeah, yeah, but um, what about you? Any New Year's resolutions, Tim? Me, no, I don't make them either, man. I just do them, you know what I mean? Oh, wow, you're uh, like full of yourself, Jesus Christ! Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I'll tell you what, my running's gotten stronger, it's gotten like surprisingly stronger. Uh, because of the the weather here lately, I've been having a running treadmill. You know, being able to sustain three and four and five inclines on the treadmill for distance and speed and time is is pretty impressive. Feels good too, doesn't it? It feels great. I used to love it. Yeah. I miss I miss being able to sustain on incline. What are you running now? What do you mean? What am I running? Like uh, time? your your time on incline. Oh, you know, so I do intervals in incline, right? So I um if I run a sub ten minute mi- ten minute mile on a four or five incline. I started getting into sustaining a zone five, which I don't want to do, uh, but I still can do it for about 15, 20 minutes, which, you know, not something I could have done before. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's uh, I I try to maintain an interval between a speed between four and seven uh, on an incline between three, four and five, just depending on what I feel like on that day. But, you know, usually when I, when I go back and I set my, like uh, my strength and my mood on my Garmin app, it's usually about, you know, three in effort, three out of 10 in effort, even on a five incline running a four to seven speed interval. So, um, yeah, awesome. do pretty well. All right. Well, guys, uh, I, I think everybody just heard the next two weeks worth of, uh, <laughs> of uh, information here. Like we're probably going to talk about work on the next episode and like job hunting and what the great resignation feels like. And then I think, we're going to switch over to uh, training on a treadmill and how that influences your actual runs. Um, I think that'd be a fun topic. I will, I would like to di- dive into that because I'm a huge fan of um, training on treads. So uh, yeah, until next week, guys, y'all have a good one. Stay safe out there. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers.